Hello and welcome to another one of our Business Spotlight uh, interviews with uh, leading business leaders and success stories. So uh, I've got somebody with me today who uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing from and uh, similar backgrounds in terms of you know the whole marketing piece and growing and developing businesses. So um, I'm sure those of you who are watching and listening now are going to learn a great deal. So just to sort of confirm, my name is Gary Howells. I'm an action coach uh, based in Dorset. So helping business owners to grow and develop their businesses, which is my forte and my love. So I'm going to kick straight off and, and pass you across to um, Jack Newman. And Jack, so uh, welcome. And tell us a little bit about who you are and, and what you do. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, yeah, pleasure to, to kind of join you. So um, yeah, as you mentioned, my name is Jack. I run a company called UKB Marketing. Um, we're Bournemouth-based, been going for uh, just over six years. So December the 13th, I think, we turned uh, officially six years old. Um, and we offer digital services to businesses both locally and um, throughout the UK and occasionally work with uh, international companies as well. Um, we offer a range of services ranging from paid media, which is the bulk of our deliverables, and we also do web design um, and some of the other kind of uh, services that support that main core offering of our business. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's kind of the uh, overview of what we do. And um, yeah, like I say, performance based and um, yeah. Yeah, enjoy working with companies both locally and, uh, and throughout the UK. Great, thanks, Jack. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw straight in here because it seems like there's a million and one people in your field doing digital, offering website, offer pay per click, operating this, get your highest up the rankings, and all sorts of things. Not every company can get you to the top of the Google rankings, so you always sort of take it with a a pinch of salt. So so how do you sort of differentiate yourself in a very crowded and competitive marketplace so that you know people buy into what you're doing and understand what it is and and how you really help the bottom line for your prospective clients yeah i, I agree it's, it is ridiculously saturated um just in the local area alone there's so many agencies offering some are offering the exact same as us some are offering um additional services one thing we've done to differentiate ourselves is we've niched down so we don't offer every service under the sun. So obviously under the digital services bracket, there's SEO, web design, um, there's organic social media, like content creation, there's community management. There's just a whole host of stuff. Um, we've niched down to offer services that essentially are related to paid advertising only. So that means that our entire team and our skill set as a team can be really improved and niched and double down on what works for those specific services. Um, and we can make sure that the deliverables that we actually offer are extremely high quality. Because personally, I feel like if you're running a business where you offer every service, especially when you're, you know, we're only six years old, we're you know, still relatively new. And, um, you know, when we're, if we're trying to offer every single thing, my concern was that if we go that broad, we're going to do nothing very, very well. So instead, we decided to offer fewer services that all complement each other so that the team we build can all have. Uh, a lot of synergy in the way that we um, provide their services basically for the companies. Mm. And and how do you sort of uh, demonstrate your value for money, the return on investment? Because a lot of people obviously don't view marketing as an investment. They view it as a cost, but obviously from a coaching point of view for us, it's obviously an investment and you want a good return yeah. on your investment. So how do you sort of position that and and explain that to prospective clients? I mean, the good thing about what we do is it's very direct. So all the platforms that we market on, we can see, and, and there are a, a range of different methods that we can attribute the revenue they're getting in their business directly to that outlay. Now, that is um, that is an amazing thing that we can show. It also means we have to perform because we're not like a company that, that kind of can fly under the radar in the sense that we're getting paid to just deliver kind of services. Like mm. it, it, the cost is typically high enough for the, the company that they are keeping a very close eye on, right, what am I spending and what am I getting back, especially with paid media where there's the cost of both the agency to manage it and the cost of actually paying for that reach on platforms like Meta, Google, et cetera. So we put in place, and these systems already exist, but we put in place um, very um, intricate reporting metrics for those brands. So they know, right, I'm spending this. This is what I'm getting, both attributed sales and then also looking at overall uplift and things like that. But yeah, you know, we get judged day to day, week to week, month to month, really by the directly attributable results um, that we can say you've spent X and you've got Y back. And if, if that doesn't exist, then um, 
then unfortunately we don't keep the client for very long. So <laughs> absolutely, yeah. If it's as transparent as that and as immediate as that, it's uh, you say you 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 live or die by your numbers. That's actually a, a truth of business, isn't it? So uh, yeah, yeah it, it doesn't paint the full picture. Like obviously, any marketing you do is going to have an uplift. You're getting your brand out there, etc. But you know that's not we we can't retain a client based on on that kind of general overall uplift because yeah. you know, they can get that these platforms are self-serve so they can get some of that uplift doing it kind of incorrectly themselves for us it, it's got to be very black and white as in are mm -hmm. they getting more money than they're paying us with their ad spend and, and the numbers work with their profit yeah. margins and you know their customer lpv and all that good stuff and if it does amazing and if not then um yeah it certainly won't won't kind of retain yeah. with us <laughs> excellent well great thanks for that uh insight and understanding Let, let's sort of go back to uh when you started sort of six years or so ago then jack you know if you look back what would you have done differently um that is that is a really tricky question i think the main thing i would do if i was going to do it again is to build it with less personal involvement in the deliverables for myself so I was for the first few years doing the majority or basically doing all of the delivering of the actual services to the clients um, that created, obviously that's good because it means I understand every part of what the business delivers. Mm. And if there's issues I can deal with them, I'm not relying on, on someone else. However, obviously that works when you have a few clients, but when you're trying to build a business and, and scale it, there comes a point where that's just no longer um, possible. And I think that, if I could do it differently, it would have been to build it with that more in mind from day one so that I could focus on growing the business more and promoting the business itself more rather than get being stuck in the deliverables yeah. for clients because that, I think, slowed the growth quite a lot. But, yeah, I don't know how it would play out if that if it went that way because there's yeah. plus and minuses to, for that approach, I think. Yeah. And how big's your, your team now then, Jack? And what was it? Did you sort of gradually grow the numbers or suddenly was there a spike at somewhere along the line? Yeah. So there's six of us at the moment. So not a huge team, um, but everyone is full time with us and you know, employed by us. Uh, we don't really use freelancers that much. We have dabbled in that. But again, it's, it comes back to quality. So our business really lives and dies on retention because it, you know, it's, as you mentioned at the beginning, it's highly competitive. So we need to retain clients in our business and we need to build long-term relationships. And the way that we can have our product and our service basically as the best possible um, offering is, and I feel is to have a, a team that's, that's mm. full-time focused fully on this business and not... Um, too too remote and, and spread apart i know other companies do it differently but that's just what we found um, yeah. from our experience so yeah it, it grew it did grow gradually for the first couple of years really small and then um about three years ago we um we hired a, a i think we had three or four people in one year and then we ended up replacing a couple of different staff uh, roles throughout the, the next couple of years and that's kind of got us to where we're at at the moment hopefully 2024 we'll be able to kind of push and, and scale up some more bring some more people on board of course um but it's, yeah, just a balance between making everything fit mm. so that we can do that in a sustainable way and, um, yeah, grow. Yeah. I mean, it's something I come across quite often with business owners. They're very reluctant to let go and not recruit staff and then struggle to delegate in all those elements. And, uh, you know, yeah. you, as a business owner, you've got to do what you're good at and you're not good at everything. So you've got to make sure you've got the right team around you. And, I mean... Within Action Coach, one of the we focus, a lot of the work we do is in three areas, of which one of them fundamentally is the team um, and getting that square pegs and square holes. And when you look at the the team, you know, going down sort of the leadership and management side of things now, I mean, what have you learned about managing people and in a growing business and recruiting and changing roles, etc.? Yeah, I'm interested to know what what you learned around leadership and management for yourself and how you've developed. Yeah, I think one thing that I did wrong with management initially was um, being too much of a micromanager, and I still am. Like I'm, you know, I, I have my idea of how I want things to go. I have like the, I, I feel a lot of pressure to make sure everything we deliver for our clients is like the best we possibly can, and everything's working. And I think that led me to, um, and I'm getting a lot better at it. But I'm sure that there's, uh, if you spoke to my team, I'm sure you'd <laughs> say there's room to improve. Um, but. I think what I did wrong at the beginning a lot is to, yeah, to try and kind of just micromanage everything. And again, it's unsustainable the more the team grows, it's unsustainable the more that the client um, base grows. And it also doesn't allow people to go through their own learning cycles of making mistakes. So I realized one of the reasons why I was able to learn very quickly certain things is because 
I was very forgiving on myself for making mistakes, but I was less forgiving on other people for making mistakes mm. that I thought that I could potentially do differently or, or could have not made those specific mistakes. So I think I realized that everyone has to go through their own learning cycles and it's okay for our team to make mistakes and those feedback loops that they get is going to enable them to grow quicker than me trying to step into, you know, stop something happening or something going wrong. But actually that prevents everyone from really taking full responsibility and control for their individual roles. And I would say that that is without doubt probably the biggest thing that I've learned in terms of managing people. Okay. And um, when you look at recruiting people, I, what sort of culture are you trying to create? What are you looking for in individuals when you're interviewing them to bring them into your team? I mean, do you have values? Do you have a mission statement and a vision and all that sort of thing? Yeah, we, we do have company values. Um, I think the, the biggest things that we, the biggest characteristics that I think make um, someone the most likely to kind of come with us and that we look for is and it's hard to demonstrate at first. I think it becomes more evident once you onboard them. But that is the ability for someone to problem solve themselves. So when they're presented with issues within the business, be that with clients or with solving internal problems or whatever it is, having someone who is willing and able and kind of motivated to find those solutions themselves and do that kind of additional level of like research and and investing into right. Okay, I'm, I'm maybe not so good at this thing. I'm going to put. I'm going to find resources to help me get better. So without the need for, in this example, for me to kind of be there helping them with one specific thing, they're able to grow themselves independently. Um, I think that is a massively important characteristic. And that kind of, I think that comes from the desire to just really like deliver the best possible service for the clients that we haven't really been on board with, like the business mission. I think that motivates people to then find those solutions um themselves to problems and be quite like self-motivated is a very um i think that's written on every single job description but <laughs> like that's kind of my definition of self-motivated and i think that that's what we look for definitely yeah excellent i mean on, on the sort of team thing that, well that was one of the three things we focus on i mean what you've just said leads to another one in terms of time you know you've got staff there you're good at delegating how do you get a sort of work-life balance um i don't <laughs> <laughs> I don't really. Um, I mean, saying that, of course, yeah, there's times I would say I don't really have a work-life balance as such. I, I work a disproportionate amount compared to other things, but that's it's, it's kind of by design. I'm happy for that. Like, mm -hmm. I understand that, you know, if you're going to compete with, you know, other companies in the in the space and you're, you're going to try and grow, you've got to put the time in to, to do that. Um, and ultimately, you know, it's it just got to keep pushing. So I'm I'm happy for that. And I don't, I didn't mind it. Um, there are times, I think there's almost like periods of time where you go through being more focused on, right, like just, you're just doing a crazy amount of work and then you can obviously lighten up the the workload and it kind of goes in in those, in that sort of like seasonality, if, if you like, in terms of the amount of time you put in versus not. Um, yeah, I don't have the best, I, I wouldn't say I'm the best one to give advice on work-life balance, that is for sure. Um, <laughs> no, I've not quite found that one yet. But okay, right, <laughs> we'll thanks. get there. <laughs> all the time yeah excellent um i mean and then yeah. just going on to the third one that we focus a lot on i'd be interested in your insight on is um finance you know that's all about again the bottom line cash flow how, yeah. how do you sort of manage cash flow do you have cash flow projections what sort of systems do you have in place to keep your eye on the ball and make sure one that you're profitable your margins are right and that you know you're moving in the right direction yeah so we do have we do have pretty good um financial controls in terms of working some of that stuff out so we were lucky in the sense that everything the growth has been all self-funded so we've been able to you know, we, we started from absolute zero um but as we gained clients we were able to you know reinvest that money and to grow all using the cash generated from the business so we've not had to rely on finance and then obviously the repayments that are involved in that so that's been quite good in that sense, um, it's maybe resulted in a slightly slower growth curve versus being able to front load some of that you know, employment and things like that. Um, however, I think it's also had its advantages in the sense that we're not um, we're not highly leveraged. And also at the beginning, to be upfront, we, there was no way we would have got that finance. We didn't, you know, there, there was no ability to get that. So it had to come from um, from kind of building up. In terms of yeah, cash flow projections and making sure that we're profitable month on month, um, 
we look at a few metrics. So obviously, as we're a service-based business, we're looking at the ultimately the time that our team is allocated to each individual client. So we have like time tracking um, involved in the business. And yeah, again, there's been times where we've not done enough of that, and then we've really done like you know, over the, I would say the last um, twelve months or you know, even six months, we've really, really doubled down on some of that stuff. It depends on the pricing. Again, in a service business, obviously, it depends on the pricing um, structures. So some of our clients are on uh, like legacy pricing models from years ago. One thing we've done well is retain clients for a long time. So you know, some are, are paying legacy prices for services that now really wouldn't be classed as like the most profitable deals, but they're very, very stable on long term. Obviously, other clients come on board with pricing based on their needs. So but yeah, to give a more direct answer, I would say um, we're looking at time allocated from our, our team to the, the client, obviously just reconciling that against the amount that they actually pay us as a business and then adjusting for you know, other, other costs. So we kind of have our net profit, if you like, for each client. Yeah. A big thing is looking at LTV because customer acquisition cost for us is expensive, be that in staff time, if we're doing manual outreach or paid advertising for ourselves, it's, it's very costly to get a client in our industry. Um, but the good news is the lifetime value of each customer can be extremely high. Yeah. So it, you know, we're, we're looking at, okay, what is the, and uh, we have all these metrics in place since starting the business, what is our average LTV and what is our, you know, how long do clients stay with us and what's the average kind of payment to us each month. So we can use some of these numbers to say, right, we can afford this much on customer acquisition cost. And this is our margins on delivery for that product or, or in our case of service. Um, and then work out our, our bottom line from there really. And then, yeah, save some and, and look at reinvesting that into additional hires and things like that. Okay, great. Excellent. Thanks, Jack. Um, you know, you've been around for six years now, so you've enjoyed the highs and had some lows over that period, no doubt mm -hmm. at all. So when you look back, what, what have been your biggest challenges and should you have seen them coming? How did you overcome them? Talk through some examples of, of what you did and how you got to where you are now off the back of some of the, the learning you got, no doubt, from those challenges. Sure. I think um, biggest challenges at the beginning was just staying afloat, like was just yeah, we get a client, we lose a client. And a lot of that was due to, um, one, us not nailing down on our deliverables enough. So, you know, we were kind of offering everything and we were we were trying to do whatever we could to kind of help these clients and, and deliver. And we kind of oversold what we could do. And then the delivery, although we delivered a lot for the price they were paying us, it didn't match the kind of ridiculously unrealistic expectations we'd set out right at the very beginning. And that was, you know, that's a lesson we learned very, very early on, of course. Um but that was definitely a challenge to overcome initially was setting the correct expectations with clients and simplifying our, our product offering into something that is um, succinct and is deliverable. And you're know, really looking at, okay, we can offer all this stuff, but what should we be offering for this price? And how can we make it attributable in terms of the results they're getting like we spoke about before so they can really see. And that's one, one of the reasons why we pushed more and more into paid media because we can clearly say, you're investing this, you're getting that. Um, other struggles we've had, I mean, yeah, so I, I think the majority of the struggles, I'm going to be honest, were, were early days. And that was, yeah, just due to cash flow, um, due to client retention, due to getting new clients, just feeling that pressure of of trying to start and grow something when it's very, very, very tight. Um, but once we've been able to kind of get a bit more, um, yeah, once we've been able to retain clients for a longer period of time, get more cash flow, obviously that's helped us. Um, there's still been, you know, if, if you... Yeah, if I think back to it, there's still been tons and tons of kind of micro ups and downs in terms of, yeah, going in certain directions and realizing, oh, that's the wrong direction. You know, we're, we're going towards this industry and we're trying to get more clients in this industry. And then we realize there's a bunch of reasons why that's not the best one for us. And then we need to kind of pivot. And yeah, there's lots and lots of those sort of things that have happened along the way. Um, but those would probably be the biggest. Yeah, I think at the beginning is the, the biggest challenges were just managing yeah. cash flow. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So let, let's turn the other way and look forward. I would imagine your industry, your type of business is one of those most at threat, I guess, of artificial intelligence and the way that's going. And I guess sort of from the bit I know about artificial intelligence, content creation, those sorts of things, website design, which I don't think you do fully on that. I mean, how are you looking to the future? What do you see? How are you dealing with the challenges that are potentially on the horizon? And you know, and what opportunities do you see out of that? Because obviously for every challenge is an opportunity. So it's all about mindset yeah. and attitude. So how do you look at that as a, as in a growing and developing industry and yourself in that industry? 
<laughs> so I think in terms of opportunity, there's definitely like, you know, if, if these tools can cut staff costs down um, and can deliver stuff at a quicker, quicker time frame, especially for like ad creative, mm-hmm. um, that could definitely be something that's useful. We already use like AI tools for things like copywriting, not to, not as a final delivery, but mm-hmm. as a base and for ideas. So it's really good to kind of shortcut some of the brainstorming time that you would take. And then you can obviously tweak it. I think there's limitations to these tools. Um, they can they can produce very generic um, kind of outputs. And I think sometimes there needs to be stuff that's created based on more research. So you know, let's take ad creative, for example. That is one of the biggest levers we can pull to improve performance for a client. Um, the best ads, although we've, we see commonalities between all the accounts and, and we have a good idea now of right, what's going to work and what isn't, um, if we research, you know, the more time we spend before we actually execute on an idea mm. and we really look into the business, that is going to give us the best chance of creating something that's going to work. So that I believe will be harder or, or at this point in time, I believe it's not really something that these tools provide. Mm. However, I'm sure they'll get there. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be able to do that research phase as well at some point. Um, and when they do, they yeah, it, it obviously it does pose some levels of threats, I suppose. I think there's always going to be people who need to operate the tools. So even if the tools replace some of the the kind of lower, um, not lower skilled work actually, but it, the the kind of the more day to day work where it's like a repeated task. So I think the staff roles would change from maybe executing just on tasks that are like repeated to executing on like operating the tools that can do those tasks. Yeah. Meaning that we could potentially have more, we could service more clients in theory with less staff. Um, I see it going in that direction, but I've not really looked at it too far past that really yeah. um, at this point. It's it's something that I think, yeah, will certainly be interesting to see how it goes. <laughs> and and from your point of view, how do you focus on um, developing yourself? I mean, one of our mantras in Action Coach is if you want to earn more, you've got to learn more. So we're very focused on education and development. So, <laughs> so. Is that important to you? How do you ensure you you grow and develop yourself? Yeah, massively. Um, so a few ways. One is we pay a lot for like business coaches and mentors specifically for the deliverables that we recognize we need to help with. Mm-hmm. So you know, for all aspects of our business, um, be that paid media, you know, we've um, paid for resources from people who are you know work worked at or owned massive agencies and you know had far greater success than we had at that time and that we still have. And we've used those principles to kind of shortcut our own trial and error. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of it has come from, I think the, one of the biggest investments is, is actually into things that don't always work. Like you pay, you know, you, you do something, you put a lot of time or money into something, it doesn't work, but you get a massive lesson out of that. Um, I think sometimes those lessons are more, because they're more painful. If you've done something, um, if you made a mistake, <laughs> you kind of, the lesson sticks with you more. So definitely learned a lot through trial and error ourselves um books massively read a lot of books um early on i read a lot of like personal development books um i read a lot less now than i did but that's more just due to lack of time um i do really enjoy that sort of content yeah. when i get a chance to yeah i mean that, that's one of the questions i always ask everybody is uh you know what what are the favorite business books that you've read which ones had an impact on you yeah i would say the biggest one would probably be the 10x rule by Grant Cardone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I just love, I think that got me motivated when I was a lot younger to really put in a lot of work and to realize things are going to take a lot longer than I thought and are going to be a lot harder. And therefore I need to match that with the amount of kind of time and effort put into it. So that's definitely a, a massive book. And I like, um, I like other books by, uh, by Grant Cardone. Yeah. I think more like in my industry, books that are really useful would be uh, there's two books by Alex Hormozzi, Hundred Million Dollar Leads and Hundred uh, yes. Million Dollar yeah. Offers. Um, I love those books, and I love how he simplifies the concepts down, and um, I find them very, very useful. Yeah, so those would definitely um, be yeah, be three books that I would recommend hundred percent. Yeah, interesting. You mentioned Grant Cardone. Uh, there's a program. I don't know if you've seen it, Billionaire Undercover. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'd seen one a few years ago of somebody else and uh, he went and did it, didn't he? And, he, and turned the company from nothing into was a million dollars or billion dollars or whatever. So quite interesting. I'm looking forward to finding that and watching that at some stage. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really good. 
Yeah, that would be fascinating, I'm sure, because he's he's a bit of a, a Marmite character, isn't he? He's either you love him or you loathe him. He's one of those type of yeah. guys, <laughs> says it as it is. <laughs> You've got to be prepared for that. Um, any podcasts yeah, sure. that you would recommend that you think are great? I don't listen to like business podcasts, but I do. I really like the podcast by Andrew Huberman. It's um, it's more just about like general like health, wellness, like high performance. He like interviews um, some really cool people, uh, all about yeah, kind of like fitness, health. Um, because so much of that I think ties into business. Like, if you need to be a, like, I, I view business a lot as like a massive endurance sport, in the sense you need to be able to stay in it for an, a really extended period of time, and you need to be able to have a pretty good level of output for a lot of time to see results. There's no point just doing it like for a bit. <laughs> like yeah. it doesn't matter how hard you go for like a month. Like you need to be able to do it for, for years. Yeah. Um and I I quite like yeah listening to podcasts and things that are more about like recovery, health, sleep, like stuff like that, because I think that all ties into it a lot. I'm also quite into fitness. So I enjoy Okay. um enjoy that sort of thing but yeah not really business related but I, okay I yeah like no that. no it's fine i'm interested in the personal side of jack at, at the moment so I, I guess sort of onto that you know what, what have been your favorite holidays where have you been i would imagine from what you've just said there would have been active holidays fitness driven holidays were there um a few i think there's a couple of holidays that i that i liked when i was um a lot younger i went backpacking around china with a few of my friends wow, okay. and that was um that was really fun it was at the time, like while I was doing it, I was so far out of my comfort zone. I, I, I was definitely like very, very homesick and I was quite young, but um, that was a, an amazing trip. Yeah. And a lot of like really cool memories from that. Um, I also more recently went to Mexico last year with one of my friends who's starting his own business. And we we kind of worked and kind of had a holiday. So yeah, it, was, um, okay. it was it was good. Nice to see the culture there and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say those are probably two of my most memorable trips for sure. Okay, great. Excellent. And last question. What's on the bucket list? Um, skydiving. I'd like to okay. skydiving. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely yeah. something I've never done. Um, yeah. yeah, I would love to do that. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Jack, that's brilliant. Thanks very much for your your time and for the insights. And I'm sure uh, many people watching this will have been really interested and learned a great deal from it. So really value taking your time out and sharing with everybody. So, um, so thanks very much. And Jack? Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Pleasure.